It's the 20th of February, 1947. It's a cold winter morning in the desert of New Mexico, when a countdown to a revolutionary military space mission starts. Four, three, two, one, zero, rocket away. A V-2 rocket weighing 14 tons is launched from White Sands Missile Range, equipped with standard measurement instruments and one of the most unexpected and forgettable life forms. This multi-million dollar operation, funded by the government and made possible by hundreds of scientists, all relied on this one insignificant animal. The goal was to explore the effects of radiation exposure at high altitudes. With a maximum speed of over 1,500 meters per second, the rocket reached a height of 109 kilometers in 3 minutes and 10 seconds. So just high enough to count as official outer space. Even though a rocket launch is one of the most extreme situations you can put an animal in, it miraculously survived the whole operation. And with this historic landing, it became the first life form to ever intentionally travel to outer space. The first animal to ever leave Earth was a fruit fly. It seems so insignificant, but later on, scientists found that the fly's genetics had not been mutated by outer space radiation, which literally paved the way for future human spaceflight. This specific animal was chosen because of its unique characteristics, like low weight, easy storage, size and gene similarity to humans. This marked the start for many more space missions involving animals, including monkeys, mice, dogs, cats, ants, frogs, guinea pigs, wasps, beetles, fish, jellyfish, turtles, cockroaches, spiders and many more. Interestingly, one animal that has never been sent to space is the lobster. But what if we would change that? Just like fruit flies, lobsters possess unique traits such as, oh you know, theoretical immortality and continuous growth which could potentially lead to them becoming enormous in size. The size appears to increase even more when you simply toss it out into the endless expanse of space. So in this video I want to take an in-depth look at this thought experiment and see just how big lobsters could get under optimal conditions. What would it take to create our very own giant immortal space lobster. Why is it even in space to begin with? How old and how big would it be? Is this scenario even possible? And more importantly, does it still taste just as good? We will find out all the answers in this video. Let's first take a look at some factors that could help us grow gigantic lobsters. For this we'll leave space for now and take a look at quite the opposite. We will first have to venture down into the deep dark sea to learn the secret of how our planet's biggest creatures were able to grow so large. Over 63% of our Earth lies in complete darkness day and night. The midnight zone, which starts when light no longer reaches the water, accounts for 90% of all of the ocean's volume. Down here, where darkness rules and resources are scarce, creatures greatly vary in anatomy and size. Some are very small, just floating about, like the deep sea shrimp. They feed by hunting even smaller prey, or collecting marine snow, which mostly consists of dead organic materials and feces. But there are also other species that grow unusually large. In normal conditions, isopods don't get bigger than your fingernail. But the giant isopods that live in the deep sea can reach lengths of up to 45 centimeters, so roughly the combined length of your forearm and hand. Other creatures are so enormous that various myths and legends revolve around them. The Colossal Squid Exact numbers are unclear, but researchers estimate the largest of them to weigh an astonishing 700 kilograms. With 15 meters of length and eyes the diameter of your forearm, they truly are a terrifying sight. There are many more examples of animals growing unusually big. But what exactly causes this drastic change in body size? This phenomenon is called deep sea gigantism and researchers are still not completely certain what causes it. While a few rules have been suggested to explain these sizable creatures, the scientific community remains divided on the subject. 
Bergman's rule suggests that within a species, individuals in colder environments tend to be larger than those in warmer environments. This rule, however, is generally only applied to mammals and birds, but researchers have also found evidence for the rule in studies of ectothermic, meaning cold-blooded species. On average, the deep sea is about 4 degrees Celsius cold. Lower temperatures are thought to result in increased cell size and increased lifespan, both of which lead to an increase in maximum body size. Another rule that could contribute towards the phenomenon of deep sea gigantism is Kleiber's rule. Kleiber's rule suggests that the bigger you are, the more energy you need to survive, but you are also able to spend it more efficiently. This could influence the size of an animal, as a more efficient metabolism might allow for larger body sizes in environments where resources are scarce and metabolic efficiency is advantageous. Now that we know what causes some deep sea animals to grow larger, let's start talking about lobsters. In marine crustaceans, the trend of increasing size with depth has been observed in mysids, euphorsiids, isopods, amphipods and decapods, and luckily for us, Lobsters are decapods. Can we use this tendency to our advantage to grow big lobsters? What would happen if deep sea gigantism applied to them as well? To answer these questions, we first have to take a look at the life cycle of a lobster. Normally, lobsters live in depths of only a few meters to up to 400 meters. They have jointed legs and a segmented body. This body is protected by a hard exoskeleton, since lobsters are arthropods. The life cycle of a lobster involves distinct stages. A lobster begins its life as an egg carried by the female lobster, who carries between 8,000 to 120,000 eggs, the quantity depending on her size. Following conception, these eggs undergo a development period of one and a half years to two years before hatching. Then, the lobster transitions into larval stages, where they float in the open ocean. After molting several times, growing bigger with each molt, they settle on the ocean floor as juveniles, eventually growing into adult lobsters after five to eight years. At this point, with each molt, the lobster will increase about 15% in length and 40% in weight. Male lobsters undergo molting twice as frequently as their female counterparts, making them the preferred candidate for our giant immortal space lobster experiment. They are also primarily nocturnal and often solitary creatures. They are known for their scavenging behavior, feeding on a variety of marine organisms. Lobsters are also territorial and can exhibit aggressive behavior, especially when defending their shelter. So if we really want to grow big lobsters, we better keep them separate from each other. Lobsters exhibit a very unique aging process called indeterminate growth. That means they don't have a set lifespan. They beat aging by producing an overabundance of telomerase, an enzyme that maintains youthful DNA indefinitely. So instead of dying of old age as we do, they continue to grow larger as they mold throughout their lives. Molting is a very vulnerable time for lobsters, as they need to shed their exoskeleton to accommodate their increasing size. The bigger the lobster, the more energy they need to molt, and at some point they simply die of exhaustion during their molting process. Some also stop molting entirely and then begin catching diseases under their shell or even start to rot from the inside. Fun fact, if cooked correctly, big lobsters seem to taste just as good as smaller ones, although a bit different. So this whole effort might even be worth it. If you've been paying attention, you might already see where I'm going with this. The phenomenon of deep sea gigantism combined with an animal that does not die of old age but keeps increasing in size the older it is, is sure to produce some giant lobsters under optimal conditions, right? Well, yes, but this video is titled The Immortal Giant Space Lobster. What advantage does space give us over the ocean? There is a famous thought experiment exploring the idea of increasing the size of a mouse to the size of an elephant. The problem with this is that it presents pretty tough biological challenges because of something called the square cube law, a fundamental principle in biology and physics. In simple terms, it dictates that as an organism's size increases, its volume and mass grow exponentially faster than its surface area. This imbalance leads to structural and physiological constraints, rendering the idea of a colossal mouse impractical. But wait a minute. Why do animals like the colossal squid exist then? 
The answer is simple. The water's buoyancy lessens the impact of gravity, allowing aquatic animals to grow large without needing a robust musculoskeletal structure. This explains why the biggest creatures on Earth are often found in the ocean. Can you think of a place where even less gravity affects the body than deep water? That's right, space. So let's put all the puzzle pieces together, everything we've learned so far, and detail how exactly we plan on growing our very own immortal space lobster. We'll head up to space and set up a lobster farm in the middle of nowhere. We all know that evolution is a gradual process. It takes at least several generations of selective breeding to really make an impact on the natural appearance of an animal. So now that our farm is in space, we can use selective breeding to artificially increase molting frequency and efficiency, growth rates, general health, exoskeleton stability, and of course, size in general. Unlike the natural scenario, where only a couple of eggs out of tens of thousands survive, a controlled environment enables all lobster eggs to reach adulthood, which would make our selective breeding efforts drastically more efficient. Chickens grew about 500% bigger in the last 50 years, using mainly good nutrition and selective breeding. However, they only take about 5 months to be able to reproduce. Lobsters take about 10 years. Since there are so many lobster eggs available, I think it is fair to compare the growth numbers of the vastly more researched and more extensively bred chicken to a lobster. Chickens took about 120 generations to get to 500% body mass which would take lobsters 1,200 years. So now, after waiting for this long, we finally have flying cars, cured cancer and access to unlimited rice pudding. More importantly, we now have successfully bred a genetically perfect lobster. So let's throw him out into the cold expanse of space. This is good for us, since Bergman's rule dictates that colder climates result in larger animals. Luckily, it's pretty cold in space. Lobsters can acclimate and survive at temperatures ranging from negative 1 to 30.5 degrees Celsius. Even though lobsters are known to still be active and even to mate at temperatures in the 0 to 2 degrees Celsius range, the growth at these temperatures is minimal, so let's keep it at about 6 degrees Celsius for now. Of course, it somehow needs to breathe as well, so let's hook it up to an infinite supply of oxygen. We also know that lobsters don't die of old age, they die because they don't have enough energy stored in their body to complete their mold. They die of exhaustion. So we will now constantly feed them their ideal diet. It most likely consists of alive prey like fish, crabs, clams, mussels, sea urchins and sometimes even other lobsters. Lobsters eat whenever food is available and within the reach of their claws. To even further help them with molting, we also need to soak them in water from time to time as they battle out of their old shells and grow larger by absorbing water. We could also install precise machinery that assists the lobster with molting. Lobsters molt by taking an excess water, which pushes against the shell from the inside, causing it to split. The lobster then extracts itself as it sheds its outer shell and emerges with a new, soft shell as its exoskeleton. Splitting the shell and extracting the lobster seems like something that would be possible to pull off, given that you're careful enough. As unconventional as it may seem, this method can be used to help a lobster with molting, preventing diseases and decay. Studies have also shown that losing two limbs speeds up their molting frequency without affecting the growth rate. But I am not willing to rip out this lobster's limbs every year just to get him to molt a bit quicker. After all, we are trying to raise the biggest, happy space lobster ever. Okay, let's get to a real number now. Assuming the lobster does not die of external causes like disease, we can ignore age limitations. With the selective breeding efforts in mind, we can assume that a 10-year-old genetically perfect American lobster would already be approximately 1 meter and 15 centimeters long. Now we get to actually growing it. The sources differ greatly, but an increase of about 15% in length and 40-45% to weight per molting process seems to be the middle ground. I'll assume that our selective breeding pushed those numbers up to an increase of at least 20-25% to in length and 50% in weight per molting process. There's nothing stopping us now. After 10 molds, it would already be 7 meters long. After 20 molds, it'd be 44 meters long. At 40 molds, so 50 years of age, 
it would reach a size of 1.4 kilometers. At 100 years of age, the lobster would be an unbelievable 15,300 kilometers long, which is a few thousand kilometers bigger than the Earth's diameter. Given the right technology and correct execution, this thought experiment seems to be plausible. But unfortunately, there are still quite a few problems that are nearly unfixable, that would eventually cause our lobster to die. Mainly, the square cube law is still problematic. While it is possible to lessen the impact of gravity on the muscles and skeletal structure, gravity is not the only problem sizable animals have to deal with. If you make an animal 10 times bigger, it would be 100 times stronger as compared to its original size. But it will also be 1000 times heavier. Because of this drastic increase in mass, it would actually be 10 times weaker than its original size, since it would have to support all its weight. The results shouldn't need elaboration. The square cube law is why you don't see elephant-sized insects or insect-sized elephants. Living at different sizes requires drastically different anatomy and physiology, and messing with that will probably just lead to the painful death of the poor animal. In microgravity environments, the lack of constant gravitational force might reduce some stress on the bones, but the challenges related to size scaling, such as issues with oxygen exchange, circulatory systems and organ functions, would still be prevalent. The strain on internal systems arises from the organism's own structural limitations, independent of gravitational forces. Despite an extensive search across the internet, my efforts to find any studies or articles on similar topics or experiments have been unsuccessful. Regrettably, I must rely on a somewhat half-educated guess to proceed with a real size measurement. Given that we strengthened the stability of the lobster's exoskeleton during our selective breeding as much as possible, I would say that a 6 to 7 meter big lobster would be the maximum size. Although a lobster's growth never truly stops, it does seem to slow down a tiny bit after some time, so it might not take him just 10 molds and 20 years to reach that size, but rather 20 molds and 30 years. So, no, shooting a lobster into space won't create planet-sized lobster. One meter? Most definitely. Five meters? Sure, why not? Twenty meters? Unlikely. But why do we do silly thought experiments like this? Why did you click on this video? It is completely irrelevant for you if we can grow 10 meter big lobsters in 1000 years, but you still clicked on it. We as humans have a tendency to explore the unknown, push boundaries and seek knowledge like no other living organism on this earth. We acquire the gift of intelligence and we are making sure that we use it to its fullest extent. We do unbelievable things just because we can and conduct experiments just to see what would happen. Over 50 years ago, we flew over 380,000 kilometers just to be the first nation to land on the big grey rock in space. The moon landing during the Cold War is often seen as having no clear practical purpose, raising questions about the substantial amount of money spent on it. But you know what? It was fucking awesome. They did it because they could. But why? Well, it's an aspect of human nature I deeply admire. You too possess this mentality, perhaps not consciously aware of it. You were interested in a random video about a giant immortal space lobster just because it piqued your curiosity. The urge to explore the unknown, explain the unexplainable and to test our limits resides in everyone. Step out, try new things and prove that you can indeed succeed. Thank you so much for watching. On the screen right now is another video that answers what the most unlikely event in human history was. Go and check it out.